The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. For more than a century and a half, yes, 150 years, a team called the Toronto Argonauts has played for football glory. This weekend, they'll hoist the Grey Cup banner at their home opener. And so tonight, we'll hear from the most valuable player from that game, Enoch Muamba, on the pride and tradition of the double blue. Then, the remarkable story from almost 100 years ago of the all-black baseball team from Chatham, Ontario, that broke barriers and won big. And for the Agenda's Week in Review, how housing factors into the race for mayor in Ontario's capital city. It's Friday, June 16th, and that's ahead on the Agenda. This is going to be an important weekend for the Canadian Football League's Toronto Argonauts. The team will play its home opener on Sunday evening at BMO Field against their arch-rival Hamilton Tiger Cats. And equally important, the club will unfurl its 2022 Grey Cup Championship banner, which this Hamiltonian will respectfully applaud from my seat while wearing my Tiger Cat jersey. This season marks a major milestone for the Argos. The team was founded in 1873. That makes them the oldest professional sports team anywhere on this continent still using its original name. The Double Blue are 150 years old this year. Who better to discuss all this than the most valuable player of last year's Grey Cup Championship? Here's linebacker Enoch Muamba, whom we welcome to TVO. It's great to meet you. Great to meet you. Great I've seen you here, play Steve. a lot over the years, but I've never shaken your hand, so I was happy to do that today. I've seen you a lot on TV as well. I'm so <laughs> glad to be here, Steve. Well, thank you. We are going to start with that enormous thing on your finger. <laughs> okay, Sheldon, can I get a close-up on this, please? This is what you get when you win the Grey Cup, eh? Look at that beautiful thing. Now, tell me the story behind that ring. Oh, man, there's so many things that are, um, you know, we felt like um, speaks, it tells a story about the season, uh, all the guys in the locker room, and um, it was an amazing year with a lot of ups, some downs as well, but everything is literally on there. Um, okay, let's f push your hand down like this so we can feature the front. Okay, there so there's the, the football with the oars. This is the tribute to the, the rowing club, which the Argonauts originally were. That's right. Okay, now one side of it has got what on it? So one side of it, Right here, you'll see, uh, you got the year, obviously we did it. We got the, you know, CN Tower, the skyline of Toronto. Beautiful. And uh, we said, hey, I was on the design committee and I said, let's, let's, let's put in some diamonds in there. So we put some diamonds <laughs> in the, on the CN Tower as uh -huh. well, design committee. We got some stars here that symbolize the amount of wins we had in Toronto as well. Uh, and then on the other side, what we decided to do was, uh, we have each player's name, their number, and we have the BMO field over there with all the banners oh, of all the that. championships that we've won over the years. And uh, it's been amazing. And uh, inside, we have a quote and a saying that we've been talking about, you know, throughout the season. Uh, it basically says, uh, three-strand cord is not easily broken. And we have one that wraps all the way around. It's pretty unique as well as the final score, 24-23, against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So uh, a lot to talk about on there. And uh, like I said, it, it tells the story of the season last year. I know it's priceless, but how much is it actually if you wanted to buy it? Priceless. I don't know. If, I don't know if I'd ever put it on the market. I don't know if anyone in the locker room would. <laughs> well, can I show you, or let me put it this way: Can I remind you of what I suspect was the most memorable play of your entire life? Remind me. Here we go, Sheldon. If you would clip, please. Last year's Grey Cup game. Now that happened with just over three minutes left to go in the game, which in the CFL still a lot of time, but it was a huge play. And I want to know what you were thinking as you saw the ball leave the quarterback's hand. Listen, uh, to be honest with you, Steve, I've been playing for some time now, and uh, there's a lot of things that come naturally to me. And what people don't realize or recognize, or we don't talk often about it, in the second quarter, I had an opportunity to impact the game as well. And, and, I, and I made a mistake, and I dropped the ball. And I always tell people that that interception doesn't come without the drop ball. Mm -hmm. And so thankfully, I have some great guys around me, some great coaches who were encouraging me. And um, you know, the experience that I have, I was able to kind of 
be mentally tough in that moment, in that situation, which I often preach about. And, uh, you know, I was able to kind of stay focused and actually even get a higher level of focus and uh, was reading quarterback's eyes. And he led me right to the play and I was able to kind of jump up and, Hang on. and make you're the You're reading the quarterback's eyes. <laughs> yeah. You are like, you're four, 30 yards away from him. That's right. You're that's seeing right. his eyes? You got to look at the helmet, you look at the eyes, and then you kind of feel what's around you. And uh, again, 11 years of doing this, Steve. So uh, <laughs> it, it comes a little bit easier after a while. Now, I, I, I said at the beginning, this must be the most memorable play of your life, but I shouldn't assume. Was it? You're absolutely right, Steve. I mean, there's no other play that I can think of over the course of my career. And I, and I feel like, I, you know, if I've been around for so long, I feel like I've been making some plays. But that 100% is absolutely the most memorable, but to me, definitely the most impressive as well. Well, there were still three and a half minutes to play, so it was anybody's game when you intercepted that pass, so it was huge. Your team lined up for a field goal, which would have given you a four-point lead, which meant the other guys would need a touchdown, not just a field goal to win. And here's what happened. Sheldon, roll it, please. This is the biggest one to make it a four-point lead. My question is, how badly did you want to kill kicker Boris Beattie after he missed that kick? <laughs> no, not bad at all. And, and, and that's, the, that's the point of this, right? I think uh, you learn so much life lessons uh, when you play the game of football, especially at the stage that we're playing it at. You, you learn about the, the emp empathetic aspect of, of the game, right? Um, I wasn't perfect. I, you know, I was awarded two trophies after that game, and it was amazing. I, I made a great play on the, uh, on, in the game, but I wasn't perfect as well. And so he could also also be pointing at some certain plays where he could say, hey, look, Enoch, you could have done better. And a lot of people can do the same as well. But we choose to stick by one another. We became a team. We became really one as the season progressed. And at that point and at, at that stage, um, the only thing that mattered to all of us on that field was to win the Grey Cup. And um, we rallied together. We supported one another, encouraged one another. And we went out there and we, we decided to be mentally tough and uh, we, we were able to pull it off. I think in fairness to Boris, I think he got four of six through the upright. That's so he, right. He had a better than average day. That's right. And and that wasn't the craziest play in the last <laughs> two minutes of the game. This was the craziest play in the last two minutes of the game. Here are the Winnipeg Blue Bombers getting ready to kick the winning points to win the Grey Cup. Sheldon, what happens next? Academic, if he makes it. Now, you've been playing football a long time. Have you ever played a game where you saw a block and a block in the last couple of minutes like that? Negative. I've <laughs> never, never experienced anything like it. Uh, I mean, I've always wanted to be a part of a team that wins a championship. In 11 years, I never got the opportunity to do so. And for it to happen the way that it did, I mean, you couldn't write it any, any better way. Where were you when that kick was blocked? I was actually right in front of uh, the, the gentleman who blocked it, Robbie Smith, and he blocks it. And I see the ball being blocked and it goes in the air and I, and I can feel it. So I, I'm just following the ball now and understanding that, hey, the clock is ticking. And in the next few seconds, it's going to turn zero and we win the game. So everything was kind of, I was trying to process everything and is registering. We actually won the Grey Cup. So it was, a, it was an amazing moment. I want to show you what I think is still one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in sports. And if this is a Ticat fan talking. There's you. You are holding not one, but two trophies for most valuable player and most valuable Canadian in the game. You have your hand, your left arm sort of covering your eyes. You are on one knee. And I want to know what you're thinking. Man, I'm filled with emotions, uh, Steve. I'm filled with emotions. I can't believe this has happened. And, and I'm just mentioned to you, Steve, 
all I've ever wanted was to just be a part of a team that wins a championship, mm -hmm. right? And contribute uh, as much as possible. And to, to, for me to be able to, you know, impact the game the way that I did, um, it blew my mind. And so at that very moment, when you see me with my head down and, and you know, I get announced and that I won those two awards, I was like, Th this can't be real. Is this real life? Like somebody pinch me. And uh, to be honest with you, Steve, one of the main things that was going through my mind was just the people that really supported me throughout the course of my career. Um, namely my wife, who's been there from the start. Um, you know, people don't realize how much it takes for us as athletes to be able to do what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, uh, you know, I thought about all the teammates that I've had over the course of my career, the coaches, um, you know, you you name it, my family that supported me, and and I was just overwhelmed with emotions. And um, like I said, I still get goosebumps when I talk mm. about it till this day. We should let people know who aren't big football fans that at, at a Grey Cup game, they not only give out a trophy for the most valuable player, but because that player is almost always an American, they also give out a trophy for the best Canadian on That's the field. Right. Do you know you and you won them both? That's right. Do you know how many times that's happened in Grey Cup just, history? Just one time before that. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, You're just I'm, the second player to have done that. I'm humble. In 109 years. Extremely humbled and uh, honored. You did mention Enoch that you have waited a long time for this championship, and I want. Can I do a little pop quiz with you here? Oh, let me hear it. You've played on a lot of different teams. Yep. Can you name every team you've played for? I definitely can. All right, let's start it. So I got drafted by the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in 2011. Played there for three years. Uh, it was in Winnipeg, then I went to the NFL. I played for Indianapolis for a couple, then came back for about a few months in Montreal. Then I went back to the NFL. I played for the Dallas Cowboys. Came back to Canada, and I was in Saskatchewan, Montreal, and finally came home to the Toronto Argonauts. Uh, that very good. Yes, you got all. <laughs> you got did all I that get right. it right? You did. I was following along. You did get it all right. Uh, but when your career started, I cannot imagine that you thought it would take that kind of circuitous path to a championship. So why did you not, frankly, why did you not give up? Man, that's such an amazing question, Steve. But um, so I learned and I grew so much over the course of my career. And um, one of the things that I always wanted to do was challenge myself to become better. And uh, being drafted in the CFL in 2011, I was drafted first overall. And all of my coaches, I mean, there's there there a decent amount of pressure that comes with that from the coaches, the trainers, I mean, the uh, your teammates and the media. And so I, I wanted to live up to, to, to the expectations and also really exceed them. And so um, with that, I always wanted to better myself on a week in and day in and as well as really year in basis and uh, the coaches you know really saw things in me that even at the time I never really saw and so I wanted to make them you know right with what they were seeing inside of me and so I continued to push myself and uh, uh, one of the things there were ups and downs and of course over the course of my career but what kept me going were the people that were around me I often talk about you know your your potential is connected with the company that you keep. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very uh, cautious with who I keep around me. And so the people that were around me really have been supportive, uh, encouraging. I talked about my wife, but I have amazing friends and family members that supported and encouraged me all the way through. And, um, you know, I started with the, with the end in mind mm -hmm. and with the great mentors that I had, I set myself up with a purpose and uh, I kept going. And I often say, uh, the purpose that you want to set for yourself, Steve, has to be greater than yourself, right? Um, if you set purpose, a purpose that is just about you, you might go a certain distance or somewhere, but when you have a purpose that's greater than yourself and you're thinking about, you want to do something that's for somebody else, which is what we did last year. Mm -hmm. I, I played a game that I just we just talked about 11 years and I wanted to win for sure but there were multiple guys on my team that I really wanted to win it for and I feel like that helped me. That's so interesting because I remember doing an on-field interview with Pinball Clemens after the Argonauts won the Grey Cup. You may have to help me with the year here. It was in Ottawa maybe 2004 something like that and and Pinball said you need to have a team where the guys want to win it as much or more for the guy who sits beside them in the locker room or plays beside them on the line as they do for themselves. How hard is it to get there? Because, come on, let's, let's face it. When you play this game, the tendency is to want to blame somebody else if you get scored on or if something screws up. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and to me, really, Steve, football is, is 
a direct representation of what life really is, mm -hmm. right? The people that are around us, it's easy to point the finger at the people that are around us. It's very easy to do so. But when you are a part of a team that really gets together and that becomes a family like we did last year, um, you, you, you feel the same pain of the person that's next to you. And so uh, when you do have that, pur that same purpose and same mindset in mind, um, you, you grow faster. And that th there's a famous African saying, right? A proverb that talks about if you want to go far, go uh, fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Right. And that's what we did. We, we, we tagged on and we rallied together and were able to go the distance. Well, since you mentioned Africa, let's talk a bit about your background because you're unlike, I think, any other CFL player I've ever encountered. Where are you born? Born in the Congo, in the heart of Africa. And when did you come to grow up in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada? Man, it is. I was super young uh, when we left. My parents and I have two uh, two brothers. I'm the second of three boys, and my amazing, loving parents, uh, you know, decided to take a leap of faith and uh, start afresh and start anew. And so we moved to Canada. And people always often forget that we lived in Montreal first before we settled in Ontario. And uh, you know. We speak French. My first language was French. And so we lived in Montreal, spent some time there, and then finally settled into Mississauga after, you know, a few stops in between. And, uh, you know, Mississauga really was the city that raised me. How did you get hooked on football? Really, I, I want to say random, but, you know, I, I talk often about the people that are around me, and, and those are the people that I trusted, that I loved, um, that I leaned on, and they kind of suggested it to me. Really, I was in high school, um, really late for the people in, at my level, uh, but, you know, they suggested it to me. I, I loved basketball, played basketball. I thought I was going to be in the NBA, Steve. Hmm. And so, until God, you know, vertically challenged me, of course. What, you're like 6'1"? <laughs> Just six feet flat. Six flat, okay. And uh, so, uh, you know, in grade 10, I, I was a decent basketball player, Steve. I was decent. And uh, in grade 10, my coaches said, hey, Enoch, you should try football. You should really try it. And uh, I said, football? One, I didn't understand the game. I didn't understand the rules. And I didn't want anything to do with the contact because I wanted to play basketball. <laughs> and if you know anything about football, uh, basketball, Steve, uh, they don't hit as much as football. They're a little soft. <laughs> Let's be real. I don't want any basketball guys or, or, or ladies to come after me. But uh, it's a different mindset on the basketball court. And so I didn't want to be on the football field, but I took the leap of faith. And um, the rest is history. You are 34 years old. That's right. Which is, you don't mind my putting it this way, that's old for a football player to still be playing. It's ancient. How are like how are your knees? How are your shoulders? How is everything? It's a good question. I mean, last uh, you know number of years, you always got to just take care of your body. Take care of uh, you know you talk about your knees, your shoulders, and all of that. You want to take care of it as uh, as time goes on, and um, the more you commit, you know, I, I spend a little bit more time than the younger guys that are in the locker room <laughs> after practices to just you know take care of the body, whether it's ice tubs and and rehab and you know massages, chiros, and all of that. I try to do as much as I can. It's working. You look great. <laughs> Thank you, you look so great. much, Steve. You played uh, university football at St. FX right. in the Maritimes. I think you are the all-time tackles leader in St. FX history. That's right. Still. That's right. So again, it goes back to how, because I worry about you when I watch you play. I'm thinking, here's a guy who's 30. I don't know how many concussions you've had. <laughs> how many have you had? The one that was mild. Okay. Well, there's no such thing as a mild concussion. Well, I was tested the following day and I was clear to play. Okay. But anyway, it's just, I mean, you, you, you punish yourself so much when you play this game. And you almost retired in the off season, didn't you? That's right. I had to think about it. So why would you decide to come back? Man, I, I still love the game. Uh, I love the game, but I love the guys that are around us, uh, around me, and uh, I love the culture that we're building in the locker room. And uh, to be able to be a part of a team that does it back to back, um, doing it one time is special, hmm. but twice is something out of this world. Hmm. At BMO Field on Sunday night, hmm. when they have the ceremony, and the Grey Cup banner gets unfurled before the game starts. How do you think you're going to feel at that moment? You know what, Steve? Uh, we're, we're, we have a mindset of we know what we've accomplished, we're happy with what's happened, but we're trying to do more. And so we're trying to leave the, you know, last year to last year, and this is going to be kind of our, hey, we acknowledge what we've done, but now it's on to bigger and better things. And so we're on a quest for another one. Hmm. I get that, but you're not going to allow yourself the luxury of sort of looking back and thinking, 
man, that was fabulous last year. You know what? I feel like we've been doing that. We've been, we, we've been doing that. We had the whole off season to kind of do that. Mm. Uh, we recently had the ring ceremony as well when we were, you know, given the, uh, the ring and presented, it was presented to us. And I think that was our day. That was our, our time together as a team to kind of look back again one last time, sort of, mm. um, to, 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 be really proud of what we've done. And so, uh, like I said, in the off season, we're all separated and we're still able to reminisce and call each other and talk about it. But this is this was the mm -hmm. first time that we were all sitting together and just thinking about last year, obviously seeing the memorabilia that's gonna be here forever, uh, but also some of the the, the, the the film and the game that happened that we, you know, the game that we won last mm -hmm. year. You've got a lot of American teammates, obviously, Absolutely. who, when they go to uh, a U.S. college program, they do not dream of emerging from that program to play for the Toronto Argonauts. In fact, the fact is they probably most of them have never heard of the Toronto Argonauts. So I wonder if you could let us in on some of the... How do you think they feel as a piece of a chain that has lasted 150 years? Do they get the significance of that? Uh Maybe not if you're a rookie and you're a young guy, you know, your your head's spinning and there's a lot happening. You're just worried about making a team and you want to stick around, you want to learn the playbook and all of that. But there's a bunch of guys in the locker room that understand the history, um, you know, and the people that came before us and uh, how, how much of an honor it is to to don the double blue and, and uh, you know, where we're headed. And so we're just trying to etch ourselves in history as well and, and you know, do something special. Like, do they get that this is the team where Doug Flutie played and Joe Thun Heisman played and it, it, it know, comes up. Royal it comes Copeland. up. It goes back. It comes up every once in a while, mm -hmm. and uh, you know some guys are surprised, and then you know once they finally learn about the history, uh, they're surprised. But absolutely, it's uh, it's something special to be around, and, and I think you know our coaching staff and and front office does a really good job of uh, of honoring the past while still trying to build for the future. Gotcha. Uh, I'm going to ask you one last question, Enoch, and that is, do you know where the Grey Cup game is going to be played this year in November? Yes, I do know, actually. Where is it going to be played? In the city that I don't love too much. <laughs> um, I know you, you're from there, Steve, but in Hamilton. The Grey Cup game is in Hamilton this year. That is right. Now, could you make a commitment to me right here and now tonight <laughs> uh -oh. that when I go to the Grey Cup in November, I think it's on Sunday the 19th, yep. that I will not be having to look at your sorry ass on that field again and that maybe I can watch the Ticats play I'm sorry. and win a cup in Hamilton <laughs> for the first time in Hamilton since 1972? I'm sorry, I can't make that commitment oh, to you, Steve. Gosh. Sorry about that, man. And here, I thought we were getting along so well. <laughs> well, if it can't be the Thai Cats, I hope it's you guys again, because last year's game was just so terrific, so exciting, and I felt so good for you. So thanks for coming into TVO tonight and visiting us. And um, a little bit of good luck to you and yours this year. Thank you so much, Steve. It was my pleasure. In the depths of the Depression nearly 100 years ago, a remarkable thing happened in Chatham, Ontario. A baseball team, comprised solely of black players, won the provincial championship. In the process, more than a decade before Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball, they did what might have once seemed impossible. Heidi L. M. Jacobs documents that story in her new book. It's called 1934, the Chatham Colored All-Stars Barrier Breaking Year. And she is with us here in the studio. And we are also joined on the line from Chatham, Ontario, by Deirdre McCorkendale. She's a board member of the Chatham-Kent Black Historical Society and an assistant professor of history at the University of Guelph. And she worked on the 1934 research project as a student. And we are delighted to have you two here on our program tonight. Heidi, Deirdre, great to have you here. Heidi, start us off. How did this story how did you discover it in the first place? Well, I always say this story sort of fell into my lap. Um, a colleague of mine at the University of Windsor in the history department um, called me and said, I met this, this lady at an event in Chatham and she was wondering if we could help her make a website about her father-in-law who, who was a baseball player and a hockey player and part of this black baseball team that I had never heard of. So I instantly wrote back and said, absolutely. And at the time, we thought we would finish this up in three or four months, but it's been um, seven or eight years right now. So <laughs> this story really kind of fell in my lap. And I, you know, the minute I saw these scrapbooks that Pat Harding had had, I was just hooked. 
And we should establish that you're a big baseball person, right? We had you on the program a couple of years ago because you and your husband went to some ridiculous number of ballparks in some ridiculous <laughs> number of consecutive yeah, days. 50, 50 baseball games in one summer in a 100-mile radius. So <laughs> there yeah. we go. That yep. was it. That was it. Now, why was 1934 such an important year for all of this? Well, 1934 is an interesting year. It was in the middle of the Depression, um, and the All-Stars uh, had a number of players who were on the team. Um, from the neighborhood of the east end of Chatham. So the players always say we had a lot of st spare time because there wasn't a lot of work to be had. So the team had a big momentum, I think partially because of the economic climate, but also because the the team played in the center of the community in the east end of Chatham at a place called Sterling Park, which was a social and cultural center of the community. And all the neighborhood would come out in the evenings to watch the team. But, um, and Sterling and Park was named after? Archie Sterling, who was a local businessman in the neighborhood. And white uh, guy. A white man, yep. Mm -hmm. And he was the future mayor of, of Chatham, too. There we go. Well, let's talk Chatham. Deirdre, maybe you can help us with... Um, some of the demographics of Chatham, the population, the black population of Chatham, uh, nearly 100 years ago from this time that we're talking about. Okay, so that's a big question. Uh, so the very first black presence, because we should talk about this, uh, Chatham's kind of known as being a terminus on the Underground Railroad, and I promise I will get to that point. But before it was a terminus on the Underground Railroad, the very first black person that we have recorded in Chatham was an enslaved man. Now, unfortunately, I can't tell you much about him uh, besides his name, Frank, uh, but I always like to start the story of Chatham with him because the story of Chatham's black community is a story of activism, but that shadow of slavery is still very much so a part of it. So, Black folks start really moving into uh, the Kent County area. So we're talking about, for the major cities, we're talking about Chatham, uh, Dresden, North Buxton, and then all of the kind of rural areas in between. They start coming in um, after the passage of um, the uh, Act to Limit Slavery in Upper Canada, and they especially start coming in the 1830s. Um, but when we see the biggest numbers of black folks coming into Chatham is in the 1850s when the uh, United States passes the uh, Fugitive Slave Act. Um, because the, with the passage of that act, it made for enslaved people living in America who may have fled to places like Ohio or New York, it made living there much, much more dangerous. So we see a bigger, bigger exodus. So that's when the population starts to really grow in Chatham. And by the like mid 1850s, one third of Chatham's population was black. And while many uh, black folks would leave the Chatham area after um, when the Civil War starts, because they went to go fight in the Civil War and to also help with the uh, Reconstruction efforts down south. Many people stay, stayed, and also many people also just came across the border. We have in Chatham very important connections with people in Windsor, but also people in the Michigan region, and people go back and forth across the border all the time. And that's actually reflected in some of the things that Heidi talks about um, in the book. And so it maintained that population well into uh, the 30s. We kind of freeze the black population in Chatham at that 1850s marker of the Underground Railroad. Uh, but that community stayed um, pretty vibrant for quite some time. Well, let's talk about some of the black ball players who were, you know, fantastic athletes at the time and, of course, prohibited, uh, not by law, but by bad custom from playing in Major League mm -hmm. Baseball at the time. This is Boomer Harding, and he's a member of the All-Stars, and there he is. Uh, Heidi, go ahead. Describe him, if you would, and tell us a bit about him. Well, Boomer Harding is, to me, he's sort of the key to this project because it was through um, Boomer's daughter-in-law, Pat, who created the scrapbooks documenting his life. So he was one of the youngest players, if not, I think the youngest player on the team. And uh, a couple of his brothers also played on the, on the team as well. But Boomer went on to be a hockey player. He was on the farm team for the Detroit Red Wings. He was a track and field athlete in high school. He played any sport that would have him. He played sports for his whole life up until horseshoes in his later years. So he was a, a really powerful athlete and a real competitor. 
he was also the first black man to be a postman in, in um, Chatham as well. So he broke a lot of barriers in a number of ways. And how did the whole All-Stars team come together in the first place as well? Well, they were a neighborhood team. Um, the All-Stars, I think a lot of times people think the All-Stars came out of nowhere, but there were black baseball teams um, as early possibly as the 18, 1880s and 1890s. But a number of the coaches in the on the All-Stars played for a team called the Chatham Giants in the 1920s. And there was record of black baseball in the region that goes back to, you know, 1905 as, as well. So they didn't come out of nowhere. There was a, a strong tradition. So the players were playing, you know, as I mentioned, the East End was a really vibrant community place and they were coming together. And then Archie Sterling saw these amazing guys playing mostly sort of pick up games and, and got them into the league. Um, okay. Deirdre, how important was baseball to the region at this time? Um, for Chatham, I can't stress how important baseball was. I mean, sports in general was because it was a way for the community to come together and have fun. Baseball, very famously, is kind of a sport that you don't typically need a lot of money for. Um, and it was a way that everybody could spend time together and have fun with each other. Um, and it was also a way um, for them to kind of showcase their athletic abilities um, as well. So those games, the professional games are really important because they kind of are able to show people outside of the community the vibrancy of the community when they go to like away games and things like that. But even within the community, it's a kind of tremendous support network that gets formed around these baseball players and these games and other people start forming their own teams and things like that. So um, it's, it's just really, really important for the community and community building itself. And let me do a little follow-up, a little personal follow-up with you if I can, because you're obviously <laughs> way too young to have remembered any of this, but your grandmother... <laughs> Your grandmother yes. was born a few years after the All-Stars were in their prime, and I gather they did have an effect on her generation. Talk about that, if you would. Uh, they did. Um, she always talked about them and how important the team was. Um, but I think an important thing to talk about is it's, it's not um, the way that she talks about them. It's not so much just that they played ball. It's that they were leaders of their community that they were an example in the community that you know people could strive towards and that was something that's taken away she's never really talked to me much about you know who won and who didn't win at those particular times but she talks to me about how important those people were and how much they were there for each other and when you're dealing with um things and you know she grew up in the 40s when you're a young kid dealing with institutional racism yourself to have people like the all-stars there as your role models um it's it's really important um so that's kind of what they they meant for the community i mean it's amazing that they won too obviously <laughs> it's always great to win but um their importance goes beyond just that win it was what they were doing um that was important to people and who they were when they came back was also important for sure. Let's take, uh, Heidi, let's look at a couple of more pictures. That's a shot of King Terrell. Is that how he says his name? Turrell. Turrell. Okay. Turrell, like and turtle. Turrell, yeah. like turtle. Right. Yeah. yeah. You, you mentioned that in the <laughs> yeah. book, actually. Uh, and Flat Chase. Who are these two guys? These two men, I think, are real embodiments of what was great about this team. Flat Chase was a formidable hitter and a fantastic pitcher, um, I, which is a rare combination. And he was just a charismatic guy. I, I compiled the stats for his, uh, his, the 1934 season, and it's about, he was batting about 470, which is pretty good. That's pretty good, yeah. Yeah, so you know, he, was, he was a legend. He was sort of larger than life in terms of stuff. They, there's a story there, everyone says he's got the, the record for the longest home run ball in every park he's pit, hit in. Um, there's a line that says they're still looking for balls that he hit. Um, so he, he was that kind of hero that people have. How do you get a nickname like Flat? Uh, apparently, his it's the way he ran. Apparently, something about his his feet or something. So, <laughs> okay. but it, it stuck. So he's he's Flat Chase. Um, but uh, King Turl was to me also in late. He was a very very solid player. Um, he was a left-handed 
third baseman. He was, That's very rare. It is very rare. So he was legendary in that way. But he was also really interesting to me working on this project because he was also uh, a very reflective storyteller. Uh, there was a couple of key interviews that he gave about what it was like to be on this team. And so, and he also really helped, um, you know, as Dorothy, um, Deirdre's grandmother has said, he also helped to um, mentor the next generations in sports and in life. So he was a real crucial person. Let's do another picture here as well. Now, one of the names in this next picture is going to be familiar, although this isn't the guy, mm -hmm. but this is the guy's dad, Ferguson Jenkins Sr. That's him on the left, Andy Harding and Ross Talbot. Mm -hmm. Okay, Heidi, tell us about these three guys. Well, I think people know who uh, Fergie Jenkins' son. I hope they know. I hope they know, too. I hope too. they know. Fergie, the first ever Canadian inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Yes. And a phenomenal yeah. pitcher back in the day. Yep, and a, a real champion for, for Chatham. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's legendary, but he's also a, a strong member of this team and played throughout them. Um, Andy Harding was uh, one of the Harding brothers as well. And Ross Talbot was an interesting man too. He uh, was a businessman and a ball player and uh, just one of the, you know, I, I think one of the solid players who contributed to the team overall. Ferguson Jr. obviously got his talent from Fergie Sr. It sure seems that way, doesn't sure it? It does, yep. yep. Says something about nature versus nurture. Yep. <laughs> okay, Deirdre, they were called the Chatham Colored All-Stars. Tell us why you think they were marketed in those kinds of racialized terms. Um, well, I, ca I can't say for sure, but that was the era. And um, the naming conventions is something I try to explain to my students on a regular basis that you need to understand when you're studying the history of Afro-Americans and Afro-Canadians that the naming conventions change. Uh, quite a bit. And colored uh, was um, a terminology that was used uh, quite often in the 30s. Um, in fact, um, depending on which circle you'd look at, um, up until about the 1960s or 70s, to call somebody black would have been insulting to some black folks. Um, it's really with kind of the rise of black power and a lot of those kind of conventions that we see those kind of tides changing. But color se colored seems very kind of dated, antiquated, and also insulting, almost like a slur to maybe us now. But at the time, that was a term that was used. And I think that it works because they were embracing um, their heritage, um, because as kind of Heidi points out, that a lot of times in some of the newspaper coverage, uh, race isn't always mentioned, but it's always present. Um, and I think, in a sense, there's a proudness of being Black and being from Chatham, but they just probably wouldn't have used the term Black at the time. They would have used the right term for themselves. So I think that that is a kind of proud identifier for them. Gotcha. Um, if that makes any sense. Sure. Here's uh, how Heidi describes it in the book. Baseball offered the men of color who played on the All-Stars the rare opportunity to exist on the same literal and metaphoric playing field as white men in a space where the rules were the same for both races. In many cases, baseball was an arena to best their white neighbors in front of their friends, family, and community in socially sanctioned ways. It provided occasion and opportunity to demand and gain respect both on and off the field. Okay, having said all that, I mean, that's wonderful, but having mm -hmm. said all that, these guys undoubtedly faced racism in their day when they were playing baseball on and off the field. Mm -hmm. What have you heard about how they dealt with all that? That's a tricky thing to, to, um, to locate. And Deirdre and I have talked about this before. Sometimes they didn't share an awful lot of those details with their children. And so that record is a little, a little scarce. But they did talk to, to each other. And in some of the interviews that we have talk about what it's like to go to an out-of-town um, ballpark and beat the local team and get run out of town with garden implements chasing them. No kidding. Um, children using words we would not use today at the at the players and at the players' wives and girlfriends. Um, so there were some very, very difficult things that the team endured. I think one of the things that Blake Harding, one of the boomers' son, often says is the team gave as good as they got. So they did not 
stand for disrespect. And one of the things that the team really believed in was working toward gaining respect. And often, like Blake would say, the team would come into a town who had never seen a black baseball team or black people, and people would come out to see them as a bit of a, a novelty. But slowly, seeing the skill of these players, they would earn some respect on the field. And I think that respect started to seep over into the off-the-field world as well. Well, give us a sense of how they played, because there's, you know, there's an expression of baseball, you play spikes up, mm -hmm. meaning when you go slide into second base, your spikes are up so you can inflict damage on the second baseman or shortstop who's there waiting for the throw. Yep. Did they play that way? They did. I think, and you know, it's hard to piece together the record because obviously we don't have, you know, footage of this. But it it seems that they they often got taken to task for being a bit too rough on the field. But there's enough evidence um, to suggest that one of the things that has happened is when they were being racially targeted or when things were not fair, they stood up for themselves. And so that the the, the roughness often has some sort of precursor that we don't know about, but there's enough hints to suggest that they were reacting to something. Sure. Deirdre, 1934 was a big year because the All-Stars won the championship that year. Did that earn them the respect that they wanted? Yes and no. Um, on the one hand, um, it did get the T individual team, I guess, some recognition in the community, but right up until the 50s when we had the finally, finally had the passing of the Fair Accommodations Act in Ontario, we still had segregation in Chatham and other parts of the county. Um, and many black folks also still had a hard time uh, gaining employment. Uh, Heidi has a, I think, very important part of the book where um, you know, there was a, there was a, I believe it was a banquet that was was uh, provided for the All Stars, and one of the players said, "Okay, so give us a chance now. We've won this game. Give us a chance." And in some ways, it did open doors for some people. And, and I'm not saying that it didn't, but one game doesn't fix um, several hundred years of institutional barriers. Um, I mean, it would be wonderful if it did. Um, so I guess, yeah, the, the answer is yes and no. Right. Well, actually, let me follow up with you on that, Heidi, because it is, it is a tradition in baseball that when your career is over as a player, many of them get jobs as managers or general managers or coaches or scouts or, mm -hmm. you know, all sorts of things. Did that happen for these guys? Um, they still, st a number of the players coached local teams, but it's certainly not any professional professional way but they did um, a number of them did have jobs that they probably wouldn't have had before uh, there's a great interview with Boomer Harding a man of few words but someone asked him did things change after after you won for players and he said yeah pause <laughs> slowly <laughs> it did some doors opened hmm. but I think that pause in his in his interview when you actually hear it I think is really revealing about yes things did change but but very slowly, as Deirdre had just mentioned. And what ultimately happened to this all-star team? They, many of them stayed lifelong friends. Uh, many of them continued to play on different teams. Uh, a few of them went off to the war. A few of them moved back to Detroit or other regions. But those who stayed in Chatham stayed involved in, uh, in sport and played on, on different teams. And as the decades progressed and the years progressed, they became more integrated teams as well. So there were black players on white teams and um, Flat Chase played for the London Majors and, you know, so they... It's inter county baseball. Yep. So they, they did continue to play baseball. Got it. We want to show one more picture here. And all the pictures we've been showing so far have been in black and white. This one's in color. And this is Sagasta Harding and Don Tabron. And Heidi, maybe you could tell us the significance of these two. Well, those are the two longest living players, um, and they were at the Blue Jays. They on, the Blue Jays honored the All Stars at a, um, I think it must have been a Negro Leagues weekend, and so these two men were the last remaining players. So they were representing the team, and I think this is a really big turning point in the reputation of the team, and that that 
sense of recognition of, of these two men. They have both since passed, but I think it was a very special moment for all of the families and descendants to, to see their team on this national scale. Do you remember what year that was? It was in the, no, 2001, was it? 2002, I'm 2000, told. Okay, 2002, yeah. yep. Okay, so more than 20 years ago. Yep. You just used an expression, and we may need to do a little explaining here. Yep. You said the Negro Leagues. Now, that's a word you wouldn't use today, but in no. fact, that's what they were called. It was called the Negro Leagues, which existed yep. simultaneously to Major League Baseball, and there's a museum in Kansas City called the Negro League Museum. Correct, yep. So, we just get that on the record. Yes, absolutely, and yeah. I think that, that term actually, Deirdre, you, you're, when you were talking about the, the, worst of the use of the word colored, the Negro Leagues still sort of points to that particular history, and we still use that, that phrase in, in baseball history, yep. Deirdre, with this book that has come out and the inclusion of the All-Stars in the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame last year, last year, are you now satisfied that the story of the Chatham colored All-Stars has been properly recognized? Hmm. Well, I, I, I don't think I'm ever going to be satisfied. <laughs> now, why is that? There's, um, <laughs> there's so much more to say. Um, and there's so much more. You're asking a historian um, if the story has been fully told. So the answer is always going to be no. You know, um, what I love about, I think, Heidi's done an excellent job with this book. What I love about her book is a really important part that she includes at her conclusion and her um, final chapter, where she talks about the importance of not just focusing on 1934. This team isn't just important because they won. They're important to the community. She has spent time talking about the families, but also there's a whole other story about what happened after and the community that existed after. So I think this is a good, this is a good amount of the story that we've told, but there's always more. That's a great way to put it. 1934, the Chatham Colored All-Stars Barrier Breaking Year. And we are delighted that it has brought Heidi L.M. Jacobs to our studio and Deirdre McCorkendale on the line from Chatham, Ontario. Thanks, you two. Thank you very much. Thank you. The agenda this week assessed the housing platforms of the leading candidates for Mayor of Toronto and heard from some less often profiled candidates about how they do the job. Let's have a look. Sean, where would you rank housing in terms of its important to the decision making that the voters have in this election campaign? For me, it is the number one issue. It's the foundation uh, for which all other issues rise. If we can't live, if you can't afford to live in the city, if you can't find a place to, uh, to live in the city, what else is there? Got it. Jay? I agree with Sean, not just because he's a good friend, but because <laughs> he's hit the nail on the head. It is absolutely connected to every other issue, such as affordability and safety and what we're experiencing in the public realm. So I'm so heartened to see how it's been prioritized in the conversation. Asquith. Absolutely, I would say um, number one issue, um, particularly for my day job, but um, you know, the. Definitely the, the cost of, of building and living in housing today is, is quite high. Um, you know, so having a conversation really and truly about density and how we get more units built uh, to sort of even out the marketplace uh, in all sort of segments, um, whether it's ownership uh, or, or rental is, is to me very important. I have a feeling you're gonna make this unanimous. <laughs> yes, uh, it's the number one issue to me by far, just because I don't think you can build the type of society and culture that we want to have to have that vibrant city in the future when people are struggling to put the roof over their heads and diverse people and diverse occupations can't actually make do of it in this city. It has really become a crisis, especially for young people and new immigrants to the city, and it's depriving us of a better future. More Neighbors Toronto, which is Eric's group, they decided to grade the candidates based on their housing platforms. For those listening on podcast, I'll just read some of these out here. Chloe Brown, who's one of the candidates for mayor who ran last time, you actually have her as the top placed candidate with a B plus. Mitzi Hunter, uh, excuse me, then uh, Anna Bailao has got a B. And there's Mitzi Hunter, 
And Olivia Chow is uh, fairly high, even though she's incomplete. You say the platform isn't fully out. Yeah. Okay, we'll go through this. Now. Brad Bradford with a C plus, Josh Matlow with a C, and there's uh, Mark Saunders with uh, a D plus there. Uh, okay, Eric, take us through this and tell us what stands out for you on that chart. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to note is go to our website and actually look at the analysis because these scores are made up of five subcategories and people have different values when it comes to this issue. So when we think about you know, the market-oriented reforms that we need. You know, we saw Brad Bradford and Anna Bailau and Chloe Brown perform quite well. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole other aspect of this where we need, as a city, to address deeply affordable housing and workforce affordable housing. And if those issues are really high priorities for you, you might want to look at, you know, Mitzi Hunter or Josh Matlow um, or even Olivia Chow. Now, when it comes to Olivia Chow, we had a bit of a difficult time scoring her. She is running a bit of a front-runner campaign, and sometimes, you know, saying too much is the enemy of <laughs> persevering <laughs> in, in an election where you are the front-runner. And so on some categories, we really did not have enough to say we're confident in the score we're providing. So why'd you mark her so high if she's incomplete? Because she scores very high on some categories, and on the categories where we didn't understand, we had to help voters understand do we think she's going to be better than John Tory, worse than John Tory, or similar? And that's really where that C grade is. I'd like to hear from each of you one neat new idea on what you do about increasing the housing supply in the city. Okay. 110,000 homes are purchased every year in Toronto. I would offer a municipal land transfer land transfer tax rebate to any homeowner who adds a second unit to their property within the first two years of ownership. Hmm. We would generate, just at a 5% rate, we would generate 5,000 rental units a year. Over the first five years, we're looking at 25,000 housing units. The rebate would cap at $25,000. And so for $25,000 a unit, not the $300,000 units that Josh Matlow and Olivia Chow want to build, we can provide housing for people in neighborhoods, very gently introduced into communities, not a lot of height, in fact, probably no height, no massive increase in demand for schools, no massive increase in the demand for roads, no massive increase in the demand for sewer or water, so that the pressures on infrastructure are very gentle. Anthony, a neat new idea about creating housing. Yeah, so, so, so we're building um, a lot of housing, sometimes not fast enough. We've approved uh, uh, 10 years worth of housing uh, that's been completely approved. Some 165,000 uh, uh, new homes have been approved that haven't been built yet. What we have is a lack of affordable housing. That's what we don't have. And the city, and the re one of the reasons why the city has failed in building affordable housing is because we've been engaging with developers in these Housing Now programs where we're trying to extract affordable units out of developer profits or higher, ever higher densities. So what would you do? It's failed. It's simple. We have a, we've already invented the wheel. At York University, for example, the university put up some lands, uh, you know, hired a, a reputable builder, uh, build 800 units of student housing, for example, on leased lands. And those units came uh, to market uh, without any government monies for about $1,000 a month. That's housing. We, we, the city of Toronto has land. If we put up our land, uh, we put up some, um, uh, some, we waive some of our fees and, uh, and some of our future uh, taxes on those. We could build a similar type of housing on our land um, that would be, um, uh, could be adapted for shelter, for transitional housing, for seniors, and for families. It could be modified uh, very simply, could come out to market very quickly, and you could bring it to market for less than $1,000 a month. It just, we just need the will. It's easy to do. We have examples. The wheel's been invented. We don't need to reinvent that wheel. We just need to sort of, you know, focus in on it and do it. It's as simple as that. Okay. Chloe, you did mention some things earlier in your previous answer. You want to build on that? So I want 
want to bring down the cost of building housing to $60,000 per door. And that's really where the, ba the main issue is when it comes to housing. It's you need to set a metric for what affordability is, and it's less than 33% of your income. So making sure that the builders are getting access to the technology that helps them build faster, making sure that permits are approved faster so they can actually get to work to building and making sure construction workers are supported. I feel like construction workers have been really like um, omitted from conversations and there's an opioid crisis on work sites. We need to support construction workers with better occupational health and safety tools. And that means investing in technology to build faster. So we have modular in the city, 3D printing. There's so many different technologies that places like Dubai, China, the Netherlands are employing to deliver projects in less than a year. We need to empower our whole industry to use better technology to rapidly develop for us. Why do you think we're not yet? <laughs> okay. Um, this is where there's a generational divide in the use of tools. There's this belief that AI is going to replace workers and AI is only as good as the workforce that builds it. And this is why I'm focused on the working class and helping the workforce like secure better living conditions because if workers are not fed, if they're not properly housed, how can you set these targets and expect them to be done? Implementation is the city's biggest problem because they exclude workers from decision making. It's a lot of executive opinion and they're not the ones on the ground. And that is just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, that's twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's all for this Friday, June 16th, 2023. Monday, we'll find out why some tenants are on what's called a rent strike and get some perspective on whether such actions work. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend, everyone, and we'll see you again here on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.